Welcome back. We're in part three of chapter eight. And we're still talking about the four mechanisms of evolution. We've already covered genetic drifts, we've covered mutation, and now we're covering gene flow. Remember your book uses the term migration more than gene flow, and I use gene flow because I think it's a little bit better. I've already explained to you why I think it's a little bit better um, already. So uh, gene flow is the permanent movement from individuals from one population into another. So individuals from population one moving to population two. Uh, remember that migration is a term used very loosely to have many meanings, like birds migrating south for the winter, or that kind of thing. So this is not that kind of thing. This is a permanent movement. And it's also different from the example that we talked about with uh, genetic drift and the Amish, the founder effect. It's different from that because what we have here is we have the members that are moving from one population to the next, but they're actually becoming a part of, they're integrating into the new population. And so they're, sh they're becoming all one gene pool. Uh, and so what that does is that that changes the allele frequency. A lot of people really balk at the idea that gene flow, just movement of members from one population into another, that that in and of itself causes evolution. And I'm here to tell you that if it changes the allele frequency, then it is evolution and by definition. So we have a population with mostly you know, a big subset is here with the, the recessive allele being predominant. They move to a population where the recessive allele isn't, isn't quite as predominant or frequent, and it changes the population. The other thing that I hope you notice about migration is that it makes the two populations become more similar to each other. So the population one and population two are pretty different because of this barrier. And after migration, the two populations are much, much more similar in their allele frequency. And that's kind of all that I have to say about migration. Uh, that sounded very Forrest Gumpy, but that's all I got to say about that. So <laughs> the last one that we're going to talk about is natural selection. And I will spend quite a bit of time talking about natural selection. It is by far the most common cause of evolution, and it is by far, to my mind anyway, the most interesting cause of evolution. So I've already talked to you about some of the important parts of this, including the idea that you've got to have variation in the population. So in order for dogs to evolve, you know, you've got to have variation in that population. And that variation has to be at the genetic level. Same thing for humans. You've got to have variation in the population in order for evolution to happen. Next is that you've got to have traits that are transmitted by inheritance. We, call, we say the word heritability it has to have heritability. Or we also say that the trait has to be heritable. Uh, those are all different ways of saying that children look like their parents because of the genetics. So, so there, there you have it. Um, if, if, uh, if everyone, you know, do the children resemble their parents from their appearance to the to their behavior, to their temperament, um, there's, it's kind of enough to know that, uh, that, that this is a genetic quality, so heritability. All right, then the last of the three things that are really important to understand about natural selection is that you have to have differential reproductive success. What this means is that there's lots of babies born, and there's way more babies born than can survive, and because there's not enough resources available for all of them to survive, only the ones that win the struggle will survive to reproduce. So this, I love your book, but this picture always makes me sad because um, we got the dog and we've got the, the pups here getting the milk, but this little pup here, the little tiny dog, um, can't struggle well enough to get to the milk and so isn't probably going to survive. Now, if this were if dogs were like in a natural setting, that, that pup would definitely not survive um, because it's tiny and it's not going to win the struggle. 
but of course humans, you know, we might feed this dog from a bottle. But remember that if you're feeding this little pup from a bottle, you're probably giving it cow's milk. And that means that there's just a little bit less cow's milk to go around for humans. And I'm not trying to tell you not to give this little pup some milk. What I am saying is that there's limited resources and you kind of have to decide where those resources go. As humans, we can decide this. And, and in nature, you can't, you can't really decide this so much. It's whoever wins the struggle is the one that's going to survive for years. So these ones are going to struggle and this one probably will not. Another way to show this, your book shows it a couple different ways. It shows it with rabbits. I kind of like the one where it shows it with the chromosomes. So that's the one I'm going to show you. The three parts that go into evolution by natural selection, you have to have variation in the traits. Right? You've got to have the variation. You can't have only one allele. You have to be able to pass down that trait. And you have to have differential reproductive success, meaning that some traits do better and some do not do very well at all. And so what's going to happen is instead of having an even number of all of those traits in the population, due to this differential reproductive success, some are going to do better, sorry, some are going to do better and some are going to do worse. That's natural selection. If you satisfy all three of these uh, conditions, then you will have evolution by natural selection. Let's take these concepts, variation, heritability, and differential reproductive success, and let's use it in an example of evolution in nature. And the evolution that I want to talk about is something that unfortunately farmers have been dealing with for quite some time, and that is that agricultural pests, like this aphid that you see in this picture, are involving resistance to pesticides. So what worked before in the past where you spray a pesticide and it killed the pest isn't working anymore. Those, these pests, these aphids, they are, or other pests in the, um, in the agricultural fields are not being removed or killed as often as they used to be. So let's take these principles of variation in the population heritability, and differential reproductive success, and apply it to these pests. Okay, so the first one is that there's variation in the population. Some of these pests, by chance, by mutation, they happen to have a variant that if you spray it with a pesticide, it won't die until it reproduces. Like It, it lives longer in those, in, under those pest, pesticide conditions, right? variation in the population. It's not that the pesticide is is causing the mutation. It's that the population already had variation in the population and some of them when you spray pesticides some of them will live and some of them won't because of that already possess the variations they already possess. Okay so that's the first one. The second part is that it has to be heritable. If this natural selection thing is going to work, that the trait that allowed them to survive the pesticide has to be a genetic trait. And the third is differential reproductive success. When you spray this pesticide, the ones with the gene, with the allele, that allows them to be resistant to the pesticide, those are the only ones that are going to survive. And because they survive and the other ones die, you have differential reproductive success. You've also got evolution because the resistant allele, the one that has the resistant allele, that's the one that's going to reproduce. And in the next generation, remember evolution happens over time, in the next generation, the offspring are much, much, much more likely going to be resistant to this pesticide. So when I say that most agricultural pests have evolved resistant to pesticides, that's evolution. And this is happening all the time. And if you think that evolution doesn't happen, then how are you going to explain to those farmers in the field why they're paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for these newfangled pesticides only to have happen in a few dozen years that the pesticide doesn't work anymore? The insects are not becoming immune to it in the way that 
you know, like your immune system works. No, it's a genetic thing. And it's differential reproductive success that's happening. And it's heritable. And there was variation in the population and all of that good stuff. So hopefully natural selection makes a little bit more sense to you. I still have a few more things to talk about with uh, natural selection now. Like the concept of fitness. I've already defined fitness for you, like on the very early slide. I define fitness as reproductive success. Um, so there's some important things to think about with relation to natural selection. Um, fitness is relative. So if you have two mice living in a background, a light colored background, and some of the mice are light colored and some of the mice are dark colored, which mouse is more likely to survive to reproduce? Well, clearly the one that blends in a little bit better is going to be able to avoid those predators a little bit better. And so you're going to get um, the fitness of the light colored mouse being at a higher rate than the fitness of the dark colored mouse. But of course, in a background that has a darker background, the darker colored mouse is the one that's going to survive to reproduce better. So in the light background, the relative fitness of the light mouse is greater, but in the dark background, the relative fitness of the dark mouse is greater. So it's all relative to the specific environment that the organism lives in. All right, so I've got a little scenario for you. You, let's imagine that you carry an allele that gives you a trait that allows you to survive for 200 years. What? That allele also causes you to be sterile and incapable of producing offspring. What is your fitness? You can pause the video, but hopefully you remember that the definition of fitness is reproduction. So in this case, your fitness is zero. You have no fitness because you are not reproducing. And it doesn't matter how long you survive if you don't reproduce you have no fitness. And fitness is all about what, uh, what natural selection is all about. So um, here's a question for you. You've all heard this term survival of the fittest. You've heard that. And this is a misleading phrase. It's a misnomer. That just means misnamed. Survival of the fittest. When we think survival of the fittest, we think that it's talking about the ones who are best adapted to the environment. But really what this is saying is it's survival of the alleles that, that are able to get into the next generation. We are not talking about strength. We are not talking about intelligence here. We're just talking about reproduction, the survival of the fittest. So that's a misnomer or Another way of saying is saying that, that phrase is misleading. Most people don't really understand what survival of the fittest means. So now that you've got all this information under your belt, now that you understand a little bit more about um, how organisms in a population be can become more and more matched, more and more adapted to their environment through natural selection, you can start to see how uh, porcupines can evolve these amazing quills as a defense mechanism against the environment they live in, which is an environment filled with lions. As a consequence of any environment that an organism lives in, they become more and more matched, more and more adapted to that environment. Adap adaptation refers to both the process by which an organism becomes better matched to the environment but it also refers to the specific feature that make that organism match their own better. So we could say that the process of adaptation led to the adaptation of these quills. That is one of the very confusing things about, about the word adaptation. Another example is like bats have extremely accurate hearing called echolocation for navigating. And um, and that adaptation, the process of getting to have better and better and better hearing is adaptation, but the, the fact that they can hear better is also an adaptation. All right, hopefully that cleared that word up. You can say that adaptation is both a noun and a verb that way. So you might think that with all of this adaptation going on, all this evolution by natural selection, that you would end up uh, evolving into a perfect organism. And I'm 
very, very sorry to tell you, but there is no such thing as a perfect organism. In fact, natural selection does not, and this is, this is an absolute, natural selection does not lead to perfect organisms. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through some examples, starting out here with, um, with examples in humans, of how the human body is not perfect. It is quite far from perfect. So, um, so let's see. Let's start out with the eyeball. You know, we've got this beautiful thing that helps us see, right? But did you know that you have a blind spot in your eye? This, this region right here is the retina. And going through the middle of the retina is the optic nerve. And it turns out that because the optic nerve kind of goes through the retina, that there's a region of your eyeball that literally can't see anything. Um, this is stupid. Like, it's completely ridiculous that we have this blind spot. Um, in humans, it's harder to notice because we have binocular vision. But if you think about a deer whose eyes are out to the side, they don't have binocular vision. They don't have that overlapping vision. And so they literally have little regions of their eye, um, vision that they cannot see. So, um, yeah, that's dumb. That's stupid. That's bad design. Uh, there are creatures on this planet that don't have uh, blind spots, like the octopus. Uh, their, their, uh, their optic nerve does not go through their retina, and so they don't have blind spots. That seems like a much smarter way to do it. How come we got the blind spot, and deer get the blind spot, but the, the octopus doesn't have a blind spot? Well, the reason for that is because you inherited this trait from your ancestor and it works just fine in your ancestor and you got you just you got what you got and um and so natural selection doesn't lead to perfection in part because you're restricted to inherit the traits that you were given by your ancestors natural selection doesn't make up new traits it doesn't invent new traits i mean mutation does but natural selection doesn't it just deals with what it's got. Um, another example is your wisdom teeth. Uh, your wisdom teeth are also called the third molar. And for a good 80% of the population, that third molar becomes impacted so badly that you need to have that removed surgically. And the reason for that is because, uh, because back in the day, before good oral hygiene, uh, people lost their teeth. And as they got older, you know, some of these teeth might get, get lost due to decay and so forth. And having this third molar come in in your 20s would push these other teeth forward, and these ones would come in and you'd still be able to chew for another 20 or 30 years. Problem is, of course, that we don't lose these teeth anymore. And having this third molar come in and push on those other teeth is not so good. It can hurt these teeth, and it can definitely cause a lot of pain. When you think about the, by the way, that's pretty stupid in today's environment, right? But it worked in the past. It's just not perfect now. If you think about your entire skeleton, there's some weird stuff going on there. Like, like humans are much, much more likely to choke than other organisms, other animals. And that's because we stand upright. And but just by the standing upright thing, we, you know, we have these two tubes that go through our throats, and one of them just goes to your stomach and one of them goes to your lungs. I mean, how dumb is that? Why don't you have two separate openings, one for breathing and one for eating? And for most animals, I mean, for most land animals, this is okay because they're quadrupeds. They walk on all fours. The problem becomes really bad when you're a biped because the food going down your esophagus can very easily just move over just to scooch and go down the wrong pipe if you go towards your lungs instead of towards your stomach. For humans, this is ridiculous. I mean, really, who was thinking about that? That's crazy. Um, a lot of humans have back pain and for us, we have this S-shaped curve to our bodies, this S-shaped. It's true for four-legged animals, too. You get this S-shaped curve. 
for a four-legged animal, that shape makes sense. It gives you a little spring in your run. It allows you to uh, contract your body better. But for upright organisms, having this X-shaped curve makes your back weak, and it leads to things like slipped discs and lower back pain. Um, being upright also leads to um, having difficulties going to the bathroom, and you have to push really hard because you're standing up all the time, and your eyes rearranged weirdly, and that leads to hemorrhoids. It also leads to problems given birth. It leads to weak knees and varicose veins. All of these imperfect parts of our bodies, all these terrible things that, that we have just because we evolved to be upright. And, well, that's because natural selection only works with what it's given. It doesn't invent new things. It just takes what it has, rearranges it a little bit, and uses it for a slightly new function. So, no perfection. Um, just to summarize here, there are three things that prevent populations from really progressing inevitably towards perfection. I don't like this word inevitably, that's kind of out of your book. Um, the first thing is that environments can change quickly. And I mean quickly on a relative basis, but I'll give you an example on the next page of how they can change fairly quickly. The environments do change quickly. Think about summer versus winter, right? Um, think about, you know, raining versus drought, those kinds of things. Um, the second is that variation is needed as the raw material of selection. And if you don't have a variation that exists, then natural selection can't act on it, right? So um, if, if I go back here and I say, well, there is no variant in humans that has the optic nerve not going through the retina, and it doesn't exist in humans, and evolution can't act on it, even though it does exist in um, octopuses, it doesn't exist in humans. If we don't have the variation, then selection can't act on it. And the third reason is that it's possible that there are multiple different alleles for a trait. Each one of them is fine. Each one of them is equal fitness to whether if you have it, this one or if you have that one. Um, so for example, who has higher fitness? Somebody with brown hair or somebody with red hair? That's a stupid question <laughs> in a way, right? It doesn't matter whether you have brown hair or red hair, you can still have babies. It doesn't affect your ability to have babies. And so multiple different alleles, which one is more perfect, brown hair or red hair? No, don't go talking about how you prefer somebody with brown hair versus red hair or red hair versus brown hair. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying multiple different versions can give you the same fitness. Um, when I say that environments can change quickly, I, there's this very nice graph about that on um, the Galapagos finches. And if you look at the back of that chapter, or if you only have the ebook, this is going to be um, one of the things of, towards the end of that chapter where it has these questions. But I want to focus on the graph itself. And this is talking about the Galapagos finches and how when there's a drought condition where there's very little rain, the beak sizes of the of the birds gets bigger. And that's because in drought conditions, the large seeds are the ones that are going to, uh, the large seeds from the plants, those are the ones that are more available. And so it takes a big beak in order to break up the large seed. So the birds with the large beaks are the only ones that can survive on those large seeds. And so those are the ones that survive to reproduce. In wetter years, like here or here, um, the small seeds that are produced by the plants, they come out in abundance and they're, you know, they're growing really fast and they're producing these small seeds and the birds with smaller beak sizes are the ones that can handle those smaller seeds. And so what we see here is that there's no one perfect beak size. There's a whole bunch of different good beak sizes to have depending on if it's a drought condition or if it's a wet condition. So no perfection. Sorry guys, evolution does not lead to perfection. When it comes to natural selection, uh, there's actually 
three different patterns that we can kind of see happening over the course of time. There's directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. I'm actually going to pause this video again. I know this is going to make four videos to show you, but there's actually a lot of slides to cover. So I'm going to pause it now and um, make a fourth video. All right, see you on the other side.